All right, uh, let's uh, tip it off. Uh, we're close to 200 folks already online with us and it's going to grow, but let's get this started as we have the majority of you on and we appreciate you taking the time to sign up and to interact with us and to be a part of our spider basketball preview. A couple of quick things again, in case you've just joined us and then we'll get right to the coaches. And as I said, we got a lot of questions already for them and more are coming in as I look at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so if you do have questions, the Q&A feature is what to use at the bottom of the screen and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. Uh, you notice the hashtag, the one Richmond hashtag behind me. I uh, certainly do wanna remind you, we hope that you'll be able to help us in our one Richmond campaign from the Spider Athletic Fund that's ongoing now and will culminate on Tuesday, December 1st with our Giving Tuesday day. And it's really, really important this year if you're in a position to contribute. Uh, there have been many, many costs and expenses as you might imagine, some of which the coaches will be able to touch on when we talk about the impact of COVID-19 and how they've had to handle it. Uh, but the expenses, as you might imagine, have gone through the roof. And this is a great opportunity for you to help us if you're in a position to do so. So the Giving Tuesday is Tuesday, December 1st, uh, but the campaign, the One Richmond campaign is ongoing and we certainly hope you can support it. Uh, and it will culminate again, as I said, on December 1st. All right, with that in mind, let's get into the program. Uh, we have, as you can see on the screen, both Coach Mooney and Coach Roussel. I'm gonna ask each of them to make a, kind of an opening statement, talk a little bit about how practices have gone, the anticipation for the start of the season for both teams, and then we'll get into the questions that you have for both head coaches. So let me start, uh, let's go on the ladies side first. Coach Roussel getting ready for year number two, 15 wins in year number one. And we know they're looking to improve upon that with a new look kind of team. So Aaron, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, give us a little bit of a preview of how practices have gone and what you've seen and, and what's exciting you about this team of Richmond Spiders. Yeah, uh, a lot of excitement. Thanks, Bob. Uh, you know, I think we're, we are a different team, but you know, I think first and foremost, we, we've been able to, to be here since July, you know, and a, kudos to, to our administration and, and university that's allowed us to, to be here and be together. Um, we've been able to, I think, do more than, than, uh, than a lot of other places. We've been healthy. Um, so I think that that's been great. We're 26 practices in, uh, which I know a lot of other people make, I think, they think that sounds like a lot. I think we as coaches are never ready, um, whereas the players think they're ready day one. You know, they they think they've been ready to play for for a couple of weeks now, and there's still uh, some maybe final touches that that need to be done. But I, I really like this group. You know, they're a group that really did work at it hard in the off season, um, but I think have come together. We talked about this a lot with our recruiting class that we wanted to get longer. We wanted to get you know, athletic, but we wanted to get longer. We wanted to be able to shoot the basketball better. And I think the new kids are adding that. I think the players that we've already had uh, understand the system a little bit more and kind of the premium, the priority that we put on shooting the basketball, spacing the floor. Um, you know, I, I, practices have either, either we're pretty good offensively or we, we are really struggling defensively right now. Uh, there's been a lot more points being put up. Uh, the, the drills that we're doing, uh, that, that we track and chart and score, all of those uh, have been off, off the charts. We've kind of rewritten, we have a, a little record book, leaderboard uh, for all of our shooting drills. Those have been completely different uh, th than what they were last year. So I think you'll see this group while, while maybe a little bit young, uh, maybe experience factor isn't what uh, is on the other side uh, of the offices over here right now. Uh, but I think the, the excitement the, uh, of just being a, a new group, I, I think we benefited from that but also just the ability to shoot the basketball and, and that length. And hopefully that'll help on the defensive side too with the length. So uh, I mentioned to, to both, of, both of you guys that if you said something that prompted a question or two for me, I, I would throw it out there. And one of the things you did say, and Chris and I have talked about this many times, not only this year, but you mentioned you've been 26 practices in. You've been here since the middle of July. For coaches, it's probably never enough. Aaron, and for players, it's probably too much. Uh, have you done anything at all that's like out of the ordinary practice wise, whether it's a, a fun thing or just drills that you might normally not do just to kind of break it up a little. Coach Usman actually talked about this today. We had him on the radio show and at the end of their fall practice, they did some things that were out of the ordinary, let the guys kind of let their hair down a little bit because it had been so long and so tedious. How about on the women's side? Yeah, I mean, I think for one, we, we've used it as a chance to kind of play a little bit more together. So sometimes it's just been rolling the ball out there and let them play. That's what they want to do, right? They want to play five on five until coach, we're tired, our legs are this. 
you know, I, I think a couple of times in my career that we've done dodgeball or wiffle ball, all of a sudden they come back the next day and say their arm is sore. And it's like, all right, well, that that's, we, we thought we were trying to make this fun here. Uh, and then there's, there's, uh, there's things that go wrong with that. But I, I just think we, we've been able to maybe take things a little slower, you know, and, and I think we've been allowed to be a little more loose in practice because we've had a little bit more time to put this stuff in. The other side of that, though, is you always in the back of your mind are wondering if you're going to, you know, I'm sure people have realized there's a lot of programs out there that maybe have, have had to pause or take a two week break. So in the back of your mind, you're you don't want to go too slow because what if all of a sudden you're going to miss 10 to 12 practices? Um, fortunately for us, we have not. Um, but I think the risk there was always in the back of your mind and you didn't want to fall too far behind. All right. Uh, hang on to a couple of those comments because we are going to touch on those subjects. Uh, great answer. Appreciate uh, tipping it off for us tonight. Aaron, uh, Chris, let me turn to you just for uh, opening statement, how practices have gone, what you've seen from this group, obviously different than Aaron's because it is so experienced and the anticipation to, to finally tip it off and see a different colored jersey next Wednesday night. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Uh, well, I would say the biggest thing for us is we, we really need to play. We really, really need to play. Um, you know, we have older guys who are experienced. We're trying to balance keeping their attention and, um, you know, asking a lot of them as we bring some of the younger guys along in terms of practice. Uh, but we really need to play. You know, we need to get out there and see a different opponent, prepare for a different opponent, uh, finish one game, look forward to the next because, you know, as Aaron said, we were we had a very deliberate process since the middle of July, but we have really been here for a long time. And much of that time in the summer, it was it was just us back. So, you know, we tried to fill the guys' time as much as we could, whether it be running and uh, eventually in the gym and on the court, uh, on Zoom meetings, you know, hanging out, socially distance, all those things. Um, but. We, we need to play. We, we've done those things and we need to get out there and, and play. Practice has been good and competitive. You know, you asked about something different that we've done is we've given our <clears throat> seniors a, a chance for two different times to take three or four days off in a row in terms from practice. Now, each time we did it, they got into the gym and got a lift in also. Uh, and this way we were able to focus on some of our younger guys and you know, just try to get them caught up as, as best as we could. Um, but, you know, today we, we started to do the scouting report in Detroit Mercy. And so it feels a little bit more like we're getting there. And, um, you know, hopefully when we, when we fly on Tuesday and land in Kentucky, it'll, it, it'll feel a little bit more towards uh, just towards what, what we really want. And that's to get out there and play. Uh, they've got one name on their on their roster that I guess is going to be fairly familiar, isn't it, for Detroit Mercy, right, Chris? That's true, yeah. Uh, John Calipari's son uh, is a really good shooter who may or may not start. He uh, did a little bit of both last year, can really shoot. And then their head coach's son, Mike Davis's son, mm -hmm. uh, was maybe the third or fourth leading scorer in the United States last year. Uh, really big-time shooter and scorer. And uh, so – but th those are those are good questions and more more enjoyable for us to talk about and start to get ready for. As opposed to where I'm heading now with the next line of questioning, which both of you guys know is coming and plenty of questions that we've already received on this and I'm seeing more popping up live now. So let's get into the whole impact of, of COVID-19 and the challenges. And one of the more specific questions uh, for both of you is if you could give us whatever you can from behind the scenes of the procedures, the testing, uh, what the players and staff are actually going through in order to get this season underway. Aaron? Yeah, I mean, just logistically, and, and I think we both had, had mentioned, I think most people realized back here in uh, in July and, and did kind of our quarantine, we, we did our kind of uh, back to campus testing. And then, you know, I, for a stretch there, we were kind of testing a quarter of our team every week. Um, and now we've been testing our roster uh, once a week, everybody in the program once a week. And then starting tomorrow uh, with game week, we'll, everybody will be tested three times a week. So that's, that's kind of the logistics behind it. And, and, and it does. I mean, I think all of us have made a lot of sacrifices, to be honest with you. you know, and I think you put yourself in, in the shoes of an 18 to 22 year old on a college campus. We're asking them to, to do a lot. And to be honest with you, we're asking them to give up a lot. And they're living their lives differently. And I think all of us are, don't get me wrong. Um, 
but I think they're they're sacrificing times that maybe they they're not going home as much. They're maybe not seeing their family as much. We we've tried to keep this a tight bubble as best we can, while at the same time allowing them to uh, to do things that that they enjoy. And so I, I think everybody's been smart, but there, there's still just those stresses with every test. You, you know the people are doing are living life the right way, but you know, th those tests come on, on Tuesday and it's like, you're, you're kind of waiting for that email, waiting for that call um, at some point Wednesday or Thursday to make sure that everything is okay for, for the week ahead. Chris, how about from the guy's perspective, uh, how have you handled it? So, you know, we've tried to, you know, obviously reiterate to the guys how important uh, us being able to play this season, how much work has gone into behind the scenes, uh, us being able to play the season at the NCAA level, um, you know, certainly our administration and, and what we're trying to do and, and just urge them to try to make good decisions and, and understand that this is a unique time. Uh, the test is pretty unpleasant for anybody that's had it. Um, and so we, we, when we get into our offices, we kind of try to figure out which person to go to who administers the test <laughs> most gently. Uh, but now, and now we'll ramp up to three times a week. So um, you know, it, it is, it is a lot, uh, there's a, a big change just on, you know, the campus emphasizing safety. That's a big change. There aren't quite as many social activities or, you know, certainly, you know, school sponsored social activities. So it's just a different, it's a different feel. And, uh, we feel like our guys have adjusted pretty well and, and done those things. Uh, but I think having the motivation of the season upcoming has been a big part of that. Uh, let me throw out one or two more. And again, these come from, from our fans. And also, obviously, you've prompted me to think a little bit about asking the questions. But I don't want to spend too much time on this because there's so much positive to talk about. And I want to, I want to get to that. But, but, and I'll start with you on this one, Chris. Have you, I mean, obviously, you've watched college football. You've seen what's been happening uh, in college football. Have you thought about how you would handle if you have to make adjustments? And, you know, in baseball, you're used to games being postponed, but not in, in basketball. And kind of how you would handle that adjustment or if your roster is significantly altered because of, of the COVID testing. Yeah. So we, we've talked about it a little bit. I, I think that, um, you know, one, one thing, like if we've had travel issues in the past, you know, it's been important to me for myself and our coaches not to, you know, freak out and, and make a big deal about it and mm -hmm. just try to roll with the punches and do whatever we have to do. I, I think that, you have to keep a level head. You know, if you're preparing for a game and that game is postponed or canceled, then you have to look to the next game you can you can schedule. You know, it'll be interesting around college football. Now they're finding different opponents for, you know, in, in the Pac-12, they matched up Cal and UCLA who were supposed to play two other opponents. Uh, and I'm sure that those kinds of things will happen. I think just being as, uh, you know, the more you the more we focus on ourselves, I feel like the less that will impact us. So, um, you know, that, that message kind of remains the same. And hopefully when it does come time to do that, we'll handle that pretty well. And we'll be able to go out there and play the game and the, the opponent that we're able to. Aaron, how about from your perspective? I know the schedule has been a challenge already. We were talking about that before we went live here tonight about games you had that you had to replace and make adjustments. How about in season? Have you thought about how you'd make those adjustments if and when it happens? Yeah, from a scheduling standpoint, I think we've, you know, I, I've joked with uh, with Darren, who, who spent a lot of time putting together our schedule and kind of put that schedule to bed and finally everything's posted online. And I kind of told him, I was like, don't think your job's done, bud. You know, there, there's going to be some pivots that are going to be have, have to be made. And whether that's trying to replace some non-conference games, whether that's trying to juggle um, you know, we kind of have some creative things that we've already done with our with our conference schedule that we have some some windows marked there that, hey, if, if this team here can't play or if, if, if there's some other things that, that go haywire, we have some openings at, at some different spots right now. And, and then I think internally, you know, we, we've we've done a little I've, I've never really kind of put together a playbook. I didn't want to have that stuff on paper, but we've used kind of a video program that we know that if we have to pause or we have to do things kind of non-traditionally that, you know, we can do a lot more online. We can do a lot more from our video library, uh, kind of playbook, all of that stuff that, that we can do uh, with technology these days. You know, we've all kind of gotten a technology degree uh, here in the last eight, nine months. Uh, but also I think kind of going back to what Chris said, we, we just have to remain flexible, you know, and we all have our routines as coaches and there's probably going to be some curveballs, you know, whether that's 
going to a school and them telling you you can't have a, a shoot around or all of a sudden, you know, getting a, a pregame or postgame meal is probably going to be different uh, than, than what it has been in years past. All right, let's go to a positive impact topic. We may have a couple more on the COVID topic uh, as questions are coming in. And again, if you're just uh, joining us, you do have a question, the Q&A uh, button, the feature at the bottom of your screen, do that and scroll them through them and we'll get to as many as we can. And I got a long list off to the side um, for questions as well. So from the negative impact of, of COVID-19 to the positive impact of the Quilly Athletic Center. And Aaron, I'll start with you because I know you're in your office uh, in the Quilly Athletic Center in Mill High, in the Millheiser Gym, renovated Millheiser Gym portion of that. And just the impact for what you do on a daily basis, both from practice and also the other hours of the day, hence you being in your new office. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there was a there was a great excitement, obviously, even last year, you know, and I think there were uh, even getting to, to Richmond, getting to the program last year. I mean, the the excitement was was sold pretty well uh, of, of everything with uh, I guess you kind of see some of this stuff right now. But, um, you know, our, our players live it and I think they get excited. But for me, coming into the office, there, there's just a different vibe. You know, there's a lot of construction still going on, um, but it's just a, a really, really cool atmosphere. The, the newness of everything. You can't help but have a little bit of a smile on your face coming into the office. And I think that just boosts, we weirdly hate to give into this, but I think we've noticed a different energy when we practice in the, the Quealy than, than even going back into the Robbins Arena. Chris, how about from, from your perspective, uh, from a recruiting perspective, from a logistics of practice perspective, what the impact has been for you, your staff, and your guys? Well, I mean, it's an incredible facility. and, and um, you know, everybody who's on this call probably recognizes how well Richmond University does new facilities. And it is, it's really spectacular and jaw dropping. And, um, you know, in terms of meeting our needs as a basketball program, it's, you know, an A plus. And then just how it shows and the feeling that it creates and the importance of, of basketball and our student athletes all the details, you know, you can see all the glass that's involved. It's, it's really a spectacular place. And unfortunately we haven't had any, we haven't been able to see, have any recruits see it. And so, yeah, right. um, you know, we, we were anxious to get to that part uh, because it's just, it really is, um, you know, through obviously Paul Quilly's generosity and the generosity of other people um, and, and so much work that went into it it's spectacular and uh, it's a great place and a great place to call home and we're, we feel fortunate and it, it has, I mean, just having the extra baskets, um, you know, the weight room, which isn't, isn't necessarily complete yet. Here's a look at Millheiser. The downstairs is the academic support area and the upstairs is the basketball facility, but it really is just a spectacular space. And, um, you know, we, we feel so fortunate to have it and can't wait to be able to show it off to recruits and fans alike. So uh, it's it's exciting and it, it's definitely a, a huge step for us. It's hard to believe that's old Millheiser, isn't it? Uh, hard Chris, believe. obviously you've been here a long time, you know. So, you know, we used to go up to Millheiser to yeah. run out some mistakes and, uh, <laughs> and, and no longer is it like that. You know, it was kind of, it was, it was dark and, and um, not a lot of air in there. So now it's just incredible. All right. Uh, hey, Aaron, we got a couple of fans who have a very keen eye, uh, you sitting in your office there, but they would like to know what the significance is to the basketball net uh, up on your shelf behind your left oh. shoulder. Uh, you know, shoulder that was, behind both shoulders. Yeah. That, that, was a, that was a new addition when we came in here. Uh, you know, my wife is, uh, is in charge of decorating this. I'm not one to, to always put uh, personal memorabilia up there. Um, so some stuff is still tucked away, but uh, the, one of those, uh, and actually I think my son's probably upset because I think they were in his room uh, up until maybe a month ago. Uh, but uh, one of those uh, 2017 uh, Patriot League championship uh, at Bucknell, and then the other one was uh, from our 2019 championship uh, at Bucknell. So. Those were, those were earned uh, with a different group, but I think this is a group right here that we're looking forward to hopefully getting a few more of those. Plenty of space up there on the shelf. Yeah, we can make room for those anytime. The Richmond Nets, obviously, absolutely. Uh, Chris, the most popular question, this will come as no great surprise from our fans to you, is, is how is Nick Sherrod doing? Um, you know, what update, what progress can you tell us about Nick? 
So yeah, so uh, Nick has has been doing well or as well as can be expected. He's remained incredibly positive and influential for our players, especially our younger players. You know, he has a, a special way about him in terms of helping those guys. And sometimes when guys get older, they forget how much they struggled when they were young. Uh, Nick Nick um, can really continue to relate to those guys even as he became, you know, a great, great player. Uh, he had surgery a little over two weeks ago. Uh, this surgery was a little bit harder because he had uh, the ACL, the MCL um, tear. So this was a little bit more difficult, uh, a little bit more painful. Um, and he'll be, you know, with an ACL, you're usually doing your rehab the next day. Uh, with this, you have to, he has to remain off of it for six weeks. So he still has four weeks of that, um, but is, is doing well. It makes it over for rehab. Um, and probably is at practice a, a couple of times a week right now. It's just difficult because he's at home and, you know, it's not easy to, to get a big guy like that who can't put any weight on his leg over there as often. But um, I, we, we feel like after, I think Nick's plan is after the Kentucky tournament to come back and be on campus uh, with us. And, um, you know, so, you know, it's just devastating. It's devastating for for him personally and that that's uh, the most important thing you know he's truly a great player um and um you know has meant everything to us and so it's just devastating that he can't be out there to play absolutely um right right in line with that one then uh, any update you can give our fans and several questions on this one I'm sure you imagine this to follow is on connor crabtree how his rehab is going and if he'll be able to play and if so when so yeah, so Connor has really made good strides here the last couple of weeks. Uh, he's been running on the court um, in the Quilly Athletic Center. We have a hot tub and a cold plunge. We also have a, uh, Aaron might know the name of it. It's a treadmill that's basically fills up with water. Um, and so it takes the pressure off of your joints when you run. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. Hey, Dr. Rochelle, do you know that one? Uh, underwater treadmill. That, that's underwater the, treadmill, that's right. We call it. That's how it gets. <laughs> so uh, he's been doing that for a while and has been running on the court uh, these last couple of weeks, not experiencing any pain. Uh, so this is uh, this. these have been huge steps here, probably like the last uh, six to eight days. Uh, so we don't anticipate that he'll be able to play down in Kentucky, but we do think that as of next week, he'll start doing basketball activity and be on the court. Uh, I can tell you that. He's got a great personality. Uh, he loves basketball. He's a great teammate. Uh, and we, we really think he's going to be a, a very, very good player. So we're excited for it. Um, and, you know, just, just making sure he can manage it back and have days without pain is really important with this particular injury. Long road back for him. Uh, certainly helps sure. to see him on the court for a lot of reasons, but mostly for him. Uh, Coach Roussel, uh, you talked about uh, players that are back. Uh, that will return this season, faces that we know. Uh, can you give us an update on your incoming freshmen? Yeah, uh, you know, all, all five of them. Uh, I, I think they uh, they fit what we were looking for. We mentioned earlier to, to add some length and uh, add some shooting ability. You know, I think four of those kids are, are all over six feet tall, uh, which, which helps us. And uh, Grace Townsend, the the lone non-six-footer, um, I think maybe we're calling her 5'5 five five right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, she does her work on the ground and just the – the energy that she brings to her to her team on the court, and just the speed, quickness, and, and ability to find people. Um, so I I would expect that you're going to see our freshmen play uh, quite a bit. You know that they're going to be in the rotation, and uh, you know I think one great thing about them is they've played at high levels both for their high schools and, and for their AAU programs. I, I don't think this is going to be one of those where the the moment's going to be too big for them because they're freshmen. We we've really got uh, some good mindsets there that that are really tough and and seasoned kids. Uh, Aaron, can you talk a little bit about uh, having been through the league once now and what advantages might you have now having been through it once? I know you'd seen uh, many of the A-10 teams when you were coaching at uh, Bucknell, obviously, but what kind of adjustments you may make having now been through the league one time? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, to be honest with you, and maybe the cop-out answer, but I, I think one of the big adjustments for us is I think our players are just going to be more comfortable and know our offense better. You know, we we struggled a little bit yet, uh, last year uh, with the turnovers, and I don't know that we're perfect with that right now either. Um, but I think the way that we play, we're, we're going to have some turnovers. You're going to have some, you know, kind of poor decisions because there's a lot going on. 
And so I, I think they are a lot more comfortable. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're scoring more points in, in, uh, in scrimmages and in practices. So um, we're going we're gonna to count that as a positive right now. Um, but I, I just think, you know, Elena Chapman, you know, coming as a freshman last year, local kid, had a lot of expectations and had a solid year. I think she's a lot more comfortable both in her role and in the offense. Uh, Claire Holt had a, had a tremendous offseason shooting the lights out right now. Um, and then Kate Klimkowitz, you know, we had, at this point last year going into our first game, we weren't even sure that she was going to be able to play, you know, and then here, here she was uh, the, the eve of our first game. And I think she changed our season in a lot of different ways and, and the length that she brought. So I think some of the changes that the, the uh, some additional length that we got uh, in our incoming class or our current freshman, maybe changing up some defenses a, a little bit more, you know, whether that's different zones or whether that's different, uh, I hate to say uh, gimmicks, uh, but maybe some different things that we can do with our length on the defensive end. And then offensively, you know, I, I don't know if this is changing because of being in the season or, or being in the league one year, but I just think we can space the floor a lot more. And so there's going to be space at the basket, putting the ball on the floor, some drive and kick opportunities that, that maybe we weren't set for last year. Uh, Chris, I really wasn't going to go in this direction, but there's a kind of follow-up question to what Aaron was talking about defensively, and that is, uh, will the Spiders continue to be all man-to-man -man or will there be different defenses? And obviously we don't want you to give away any you know, strategic secrets, but is this still exclusively a man-to-man -man team or because you're so experienced, are you working on some different things? Yeah, so uh, you know we've really worked hard on on man to man defense for for a while now, and by the end of last year we were we were very good man to man defensive team. So that takes that takes a lot of work and concentration. I do feel like we have a couple of wrinkles, um, you know, but but we'll primarily be a man to man team, and hopefully, you know, we've talked to our guys a lot about that, especially these last few days about. Uh, the improvements we made and they can all be attributed to experience toughness and defense and so hopefully hopefully we'll we can build on those and come out and and be a, a great defensive team well i'll throw one in here off of that how are your freshmen grasping college defense obviously uh grant and jacob maybe not jacob as much but the other guys who were freshmen and sophomores it took them a while to grasp yeah. the legion defense how about the guys you got now well, I, I will say this, that um, Isaiah Wilson, he'll be an elite defender at some point. He is incredibly fast, great defensive instincts, very competitive, um, really willing to be physical. Uh, and then, you know, now everybody has a lot to learn. And it, it's really the, the constant nature of it, how good everybody is and the fact that it doesn't, it doesn't ever really stop. Uh, but Andre Weir already has made uh, improvements. Uh, and Jai Bailey has, uh, I think, you know, his length and his instincts, I think, are really, really good. So I, I feel like those guys could be. But, you know, it takes time. It takes time and, and repetition and um, just getting an understanding of how good everybody is, uh, how sophisticated everybody's offense is or scheme um, and how much you have to play and be willing to, you know, play great defense and the guy still makes a shot and come back and play great defense again the next time. Uh, another one for you here, Chris, uh, probably one of the more popular ones uh, following up on the Nick Sherrod injury. Can you talk a little bit about the rotation now that you'll have, I think, pretty well known that Tyler Burton will have the start and how things may be changed because he is a starter now. And then who follows behind him in your rotation off the bench? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Tyler, as I've said, uh, is he's really going to be a great player, uh, great athlete, uh, can shoot the ball very well, handles the ball very well. Uh, and he's he's really going to be a great player. I mean, there have been be plenty of college teams around that he'd be the the best player. And um, I really think his future is incredibly bright. And he's in a great position to be playing with four terrific seniors. Uh, so we feel we feel good about that. Um, and then I think Andre Gustafson, who's played and started many games during his career here, uh, we scrimmaged last Saturday, and you know his 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 strengths and versatility really show up so much in the games. He's a great defender, a great cutter. Um, you know, he doesn't need the ball to do a lot of things. He plays a game where movement is important to him and, and kind of really fits how we play. Uh, and then I, I feel like, you know, Matt Grace and Sal both backed up Grant Golden last year. And I feel like, you know, Sal will get more opportunities at forward also this year. Um, Matt Grace has played very well. Sal's played very well. You know, that big sophomore to junior 
jump for them has been has been very good. Um, and then Isaiah Wilson will will you know he'll definitely compete for for time and be able to be in there and and help those guys. So we feel good about it. I feel like you know Jai Bailey only started practicing maybe maybe seven or eight days ago. So I think he'll he'll make great strides. He's really a fluid, smooth basketball player. Can do a lot of things. Uh, and then Andre Weir will 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 push those guys. Strong, skilled. So. We feel like our depth, even even without Nick, uh, is still a great strength of our team. Um, and, and I feel like, you know, the guys who have played the most games of that group being Andre Gustafson, uh, Matt Gray, Sal, I think those guys are ready to help us. And then, of course, when Connor comes back, I, I think he'll be a, a, a definite fixture in there. Uh, all right, we got about 15, 20 minutes or so. So we got some more questions coming in. So we'll get in as many as we possibly can here. And kind of promise you, I wouldn't go too much back to the COVID-19 topic, but there are plenty of questions, as you might imagine, about fans in the stands and crowds. So for both of you and Aaron, I'll start with you. Just what you're thinking that impact could be both at home, where you'd have a crowd in your favor, and also on the road, where you won't have that crowd to deal with, whether it's 250 or no fans or whatever, it's going to be more minimal than it's been in the past, Aaron. Yeah, you know, I think it's been interesting even, you know, listening to podcasts and, and NBA guys of, you know, once the ball goes up, it, it's basketball, you know, and maybe there's some times that you get a little of adrenaline boost and, and that, you know, so the, the easy answer and the coach answer is, hey, we're, we're focused and you're just trying to play basketball and it doesn't matter. Um, truth be told, I think it's, it, it's a tough pill to swallow for us because, you know, I, I think we saw a pretty nice boost last year from our crowd especially at home you know numbers and and attendance you know grew throughout the season and you know i just think the rapport that our group and, and our players had with with our fans was was starting to be a really cool thing you know the fact that we, we weren't going in the locker room after games we were hanging out on the floor with fans and you know a lot of those times you look at your watch and you've been out there for 45 minutes or an hour and, and enjoying it so I, I, I really liked that. I mean, that, that was just something that was a special thing with, that, that we had with our group. So I think we'll miss that here. Um, you know, there, there's a couple of places that we go to in our league that I'm not going to miss having fans there and, and, and them running their mouths. But, um, you know, I, it, it's just, it, it's, it's, I wouldn't say heartbreaking because obviously there, there's a lot more, you know, going on in the world right now and to, to, to use that word, uh, but just unfortunate for, for, our, for our athletes that they were really, really starting to enjoy playing at home with, with the crowd and not getting that. And then obviously feeling for our fans, you know, I, I'm upset. I'm sitting here and, and getting to watch, uh, you know, Chris's team. And this is yeah, I, bringing my kid to those games last year. That, that, that They're a fun group to watch, you know? So I, I understand why fans are upset. You know, I think there, this should be a good year for, for Sparta basketball. Absolutely. Uh, Chris, piggyback on that, whether it's dealing with it on the road at, at, you know, Rupp Arena or West Virginia or Dayton or VCU, or having it as your sixth man for home games against, VCU or Dayton or any of the other Atlantic 10 teams, what do you think the impact will be for your guys? Well, I would say, you know, I, I would be, I'm, you know, it's terrible that we can't have fans, you know, we want to see them there. And, you know, Danny has all the games from last year, tape, Bob, and um, the, the Davidson. Muted, game muted, home. Chris, he hasn't <laughs> muted though. <laughs> uh, the Davidson game at home, I, I really feel like, and I'm talking to you on the air afterwards that the fans, it was a home game win. Uh, because of the, the fans urging, urging us on. And, you know, and it, it, it's such an exciting and special part of college basketball. Um, I would say if I didn't, if I hadn't seen the NBA, I'd be more worried about it. But the NBA, I thought the emotion and, you know, the genuine emotion and celebrating a block or a big play from the guys on the floor and the guys on the bench I thought it was really genuine and raw and exciting. So I think if those guys who have uh, been around a long time playing basketball in front of, you know, 20,000 fans can have that, then I, then I think it'll be no problem for college basketball. You know, I, I, I really hope obviously that as, as time goes by, maybe we'll add fans, um, you know, because it's such a big part of it. Uh, but I, I think we'll, we'll certainly miss them, but I don't necessarily worry about the level of intensity of games. Um, good place for me to stop for just a moment and remind our fans or inform our fans, especially if you go to our website at richmondspiders.com. There's a story up there of all the things that, that our marketing and public relations people have put together to kind of help this experience. It'll never replace uh, being in the arena, but kind of to help um, interactive 
uh, during games, if you're on Twitter or our Instagram feed, you're going to be able to interact um, with us as marketing and public relations people. We'll have some giveaways during games. We'll have all the stats and scores. So that'll be a great opportunity to interact. Before home games, we're actually going to uh, set up a camera and allow you to see what's happening in the Robin Center pregame right up until the starting lineup. So if you were to walk in the building an hour before the game, this is kind of what that's going to be like. You'll be able to see what's happening in the building and the teams warm up. So uh, those are just some of the things. Again, as we said, uh, it's not going to replace being there, but we hope to make it as good a, a good uh, feel and situation as we possibly can for you. So check out the list of interactive things that we'll be doing. Of course, we'll have the games on radio and television. Talk a little bit more about TV before we wrap it up. And I want to get some more questions in uh, first. But rest assured, um, all of our games will be either streamed or on television. So you will have an opportunity uh, to watch them. That holds for both the men and the women as well. And along those lines, guys, I got several questions along this line. And I asked it of John Hart this morning on our radio show as well or this afternoon, what can fans do to kind of help your programs right now? They can't be in the building screaming their lungs out, but interactively or outside of the game itself, what can they do to help your teams? You know, they want to do as much as they can. Uh, Chris, I'll start with you, especially for a season that, that we all believe is going to be so special. Yeah, uh, you know, I would say <laughs> that's a tough one. I mean, we hope that we, we know the support is there. It'll, it'll be different not to feel it right up in the games. Um, I would just say to follow along and, and uh, you know, they're, they're, it's a limited way, but I, I just feel like anything, anytime they can be engaged with spider basketball, talking about spider basketball, um, you know, is, is positive. Just, just making sure that, that it's uh, that it's positive and we're looking forward to the next game and the opportunities and, and things like that, you know, but we're pushing hard to, to see if, if, you know, if things could get better to have fans in the stands, but um, you know, we, we know uh, just from, you know, the, how many people are on this call and, and how many people that I see over and over at, uh, in the community, how, how everybody's excited. And uh, we really appreciate that and, and need as much of that as possible. Aaron, any uh, any wisdom for our Spider yeah, fans as know, to how they can connect with the teams? You know, I, I mentioned, and again, I don't even know how much our, our kids would would admit this, but you know, I think we're we're all bummed that you don't just don't get to see the fans and feel the love and feel support. And, and so I just think, you know, whether it's seeing our kids or whatever it may be, just letting them know that you're watching, letting them know that you're that you're following, letting them know that that they're still fans. Because again. Yeah, during those games, we're going to see friend, it's going to be a friends and family day. You know, they would they call them AT and T games. You know, it's <laughs> friends and family. That, that's all that that's there. Uh, maybe not even friends this year. I guess it's just family. Um, so I, I think just letting people know that you're not we're not just in an empty jam. We're not on an island to, alone. That there's a there, there there's a a big backing. And whether that's you know I, I know uh, you know our our staff and, and our promotions team does a tremendous job on social media. You know, interacting that way, following our, our social media accounts and, and the university and uh, department social media accounts. I mean, I think those are, are ways that, you know, maybe, maybe not so much us, but I think the young folks, that's how they live their life right now. You know, and so, so social media isn't closed. Uh, social media isn't shut down right now. Uh, it, it's just kind of the more interactive things. So um, I think those things there. And I mean, for, especially for those of us that are in Richmond, man, wear your gear, you know, like I, being here for, for 18 months, there, there's some black and gold in this town. Uh, we we got to get the red and blue out there and uh, and show some pride. And um, Again, hopefully this is a, a lot to celebrate, a lot to be excited about this year, but uh, let, let's all get out there and, and show off the spider around town. I love that answer. That's terrific. And I can almost hear Jasmine Coleman yelling in my ear from here uh, with that one Richmond hashtag behind me. Uh, in all seriousness, that campaign is ongoing. It'll wrap up with Giving Tuesday on Tuesday, December 1st. But again, if you, these are tough times. We know that. But if you do have the ability and the, the wherewithal and can support uh, our programs and help with all the expenses that have come about so unexpectedly because of COVID-19, we would certainly ask and, and respectfully and, and urge you to do so. Uh, let me lighten it a little bit, Chris, since I asked Aaron about, or a couple of our fans asked Aaron about the nets behind him. Uh, I got a fan here who wants to know what your favorite Lego set is that's behind you in your bookcase shelf back there, or, or what's Danny or Ryan's favorite, or Leah's for that matter. Yeah, so uh, there are a lot of them down here. Uh, <laughs> Danny is really, uh, loves the Legos. Ryan 
works at them also. Uh, <laughs> we have some good ones. Some of the uh, some of the uh, Star Wars ones are probably some of my favorite there. Nice. And uh, we, he, they're always there's always one being met, built, always one in progress. So yeah. uh, you're going to need to build some more bookshelves. Yeah, put them all on. <laughs> I would awesome. say that the Star Wars ones are my favorite. All right, great answer, great stuff. Uh, all right, back to basketball, guys. Um, I think you'll understand, and and the men's team was picked first, so this question makes even more sense. But for both of you, you both feel your team is the best. I get that. So the question is, which team is second best in the conference? <laughs> <laughs> um Aaron go ahead why not uh well, I I remember those days at, at Bucknell when those when those polls came out so it's like I went up to Chris that day and I said uh congrats I think for for being picked first I mean I think you, you say that we always believe our, our teams are the best and while that might be true it, it's it's sometimes easier when everybody else doesn't think that you know and so I think for us last year uh you know being uh we felt you know obviously a little bit underrated and, and everything and on our side, it's a, it's a really, really good lead this year. You know, it, it's a lot of seniors, a, a lot of experience, and, and we're kind of on the opposite end of that. Um, but, you know, I, I think I have to have to admit that there's a, there's a pretty good women's basketball program on the other side of town right now. And hopefully that uh, is something that we can build a pretty good rivalry here in town. I know Chris and Mike have, have done a tremendous job with, with their programs and really getting Richmond basketball, the city of Richmond basketball, uh, to, to really get into to that rivalry. I'd like to think that hopefully we can do that. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know, coming over to this league from, from a one-bid league, you know, this, this should be on both sides a, a multi-bid conference. And I think hopefully uh, both sides are, are representing well and I think that's one of the heartbreaking things too, you know, for, for, you know, we haven't talked about last year, but, you know, watching Chris and his kids last year, just a, a really, really great season. And, and I, I can say this now with, with full confidence, I, I was an early believer uh, in them. And, and I really thought they were going to make a, a run in that, uh, in that tournament last year and in Dayton as well. You know, I think that would have really shown off with the A-10 is in basketball. Um, but I, I, I see no reason why we can't both make a little bit of a run this year too. Absolutely. All right, how about it, Chris? Has the uh, news cycle already expired on the preseason being the favorite? And uh, who do you think is the second best team in the A-10? Well, I would say this, Bob, uh, <laughs> to, evade, <laughs> to evade your question. Yeah, here comes the coach yeah. speak. Yeah, no, the, the league is so, is so deep and good this year. You know, Rhode Island has two transfers from Maryland and two more high major division one transfers eligible and I think they're picked seventh, sixth or seventh. Um, you know, the level of talent on a team like that to not be in the top five um, is, is really remarkable. And it just shows the depth and talent and ability of everybody in the league. So St. Louis is great. I mean, legitimately a great team. Um, you know, uh, Davidson is always a great team and a great program. Uh, Dayton will obviously be terrific. So I really think that I'm not sure, you know, it's, I'm not sure if it's the best I've seen the conference, but it, it's definitely up there. And, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully the season can go on and we can have uh, as many teams represented by the end of the, at the end of the year as possible, because I do think this is a, a, a pretty special year for the eight ten. All right. Not only was the team recognized, but you had some individuals obviously yeah. recognized it well. And one of our fans wanted to know what your thoughts were on Jacob, on, on Jacob Gilliard and how he would rank among some of the other standout undersized point guards that you have made such a tradition here at Richmond, whether that was, you know, Kendall Anthony or Ken, Kevin Anderson or Cedric Lindsay or son Chandra Jones, whom I listen, I'm leaving somebody out. I imagine Chris, but just kind of where Jacob's going to, going to stand in amongst the stand tall, if you will. Yeah. Well, those are some good names right there. Right. Bob, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I you know, the defensive ability to steal the ball is so, otherworldly that that would certainly give him an edge up and I uh, can remember when Kevin Anderson graduate graduated just saying that well we'll never have anybody like him you know uh, and and uh, that that in some ways is true I mean the the uh, his ability to make big shots and big plays uh, but Jacobs I'll tell you I would say this you know uh, TJ Klein before Jacob I'd say TJ Klein had the best instincts and understanding of basketball I would say Jacobs are even surpassed that. He's the the best instincts, the 
you know, incredible understanding of the game, can tell all five guys what to do, you know, on a play, whether he's in the game or out of the game. Um, you know, he has, yeah, certainly has a chance to leave as, as one of the all time greats. And, um, I hope he does. And I, and I think he will. Uh, a couple more guys, and then we'll kind of wrap it up. We were going to go about seven fifteen or seven twenty. Um, Aaron, can you speak to one or two players? And you did talk a little bit about this earlier, who's made the most improvement of those that are back that, that we can expect to see this year. Yeah. I mean, we, we mentioned, uh, Elena, and, mm -hmm. uh, and Claire, um, you know, I, I think Alex, uh, being a senior, you know, I think she had a tremendous off season really came in with, with, uh, yeah, I think just, again, I said this about some of the other kids, a little more comfortable, you know, with us as a staff and, and with the offense and, and kind of leading a team, you know, I think that's, that's tough when there's only a couple seniors, uh, in the program, she's been great. You know, we've had a couple kids that maybe been battling some injuries, uh, Kaylin Fee, another senior, uh, that, that really was just shooting the lights out, uh, until she kind of tweaked the, her, uh, her foot there, and hopefully she'll be back uh, here soon. And, and then again, I, we, we talked about some of the freshmen, but, uh, you know, we talked about Grace, but I, I think Siobhan Ryan uh, it was just a tremendous score in high school, and, and she just scores at, at, at different levels and finds different ways to finish, and just a really, really tough kid, kind of fits the, you know, she's from Buffalo, uh, fits that stereotype of just the toughness that, that, that she has from up there. Um, so I, I just I, I like the versatility of a lot of our a lot of our kids. I, I think we're an excite we're going to play an exciting style. You know, sometimes that might mean when you're shooting well from three that, that you look like a really good coach and, and really a fun style. And other times you're like, what are we doing here? Because the ball isn't going through the ball isn't going through the rim. But um, I, I just I think the versatility uh, that that our kids play with um, and the and the strides that they've made I think will be a different team this year. Uh, last one, uh, maybe last one uh, for you, Chris, off of the list from our fans, though, uh, who is and I don't know how you want to define this, who is an under the radar player that you think will have a large impact on this year's team's success? Yeah, well, I would say in the summer when I was being asked that it would have been Tyler Burton only because, you know, he had a, a very good freshman year last year, but with all the seniors getting so much attention. So I think Tyler's having been put in the starting lineup and getting more attention. Maybe that's not under the radar, but I would probably say, um, you know, I would probably say Sal Caressi, you know, Sal has had, uh, he, he's so versatile and long and has the ability to do a lot of different things. Uh, and I feel like with more opportunity uh, this season, I think he'll, he'll do very well. And he had some really great bright spot, bright spots last year. Um, and I think with more opportunity this year, he has a chance to really have a great impact for us. Hey, Aaron, let me finish uh, with you. Chris earlier alluded a little bit to Detroit, gave us a little bit of a, a scouting report on the Spiders' first game, which is Wednesday at Rupp Arena at 9 o'clock. Uh, I will talk about the uh, live video streaming for that here in just a moment and television for that tournament. But speak to your first opponent, because uh, it's quite a challenge to go to Blacksburg and, and play Virginia Tech. I know that game is on Wednesday at, at 4 o'clock. Yeah, you know, for, for us, we've been talking about this, you know, since we got here, that we want to make sure that we're playing, you know, high level national tournament teams, you know, and, and hit the ACC and top of the Big East, all of those, because I think, you know, hopefully if we do this right and we get to the NCAA tournament, those are the teams that you're going to see. You're going to see some of those bigger conference schools. So we don't want that to be a shock, you know, when, when the day comes that, that we are playing those postseason tournaments. Um, they're they're a, a team last year that they probably would have been probably a six or seven seed in the NCAA tournament. Obviously, like most teams, you know, the, the roster changes. So they did lose some kids, but they probably got better uh, with some transfers and, and other kids that were sitting out. Kenny, uh, Kenny Brooks was a fantastic coach at the mid-major level uh, over at James Madison and, and is doing tremendous things at Virginia Tech. And, you know, when we were at Bucknell, we did the same thing. You know, we, uh, our, our last group at uh, Bucknell, I think we went like 68 and six in the Patriot League, you know, over their four years. And, and the first ever game they played was, uh, was at Notre Dame, you know, a sold out crowd at Notre Dame, you know, who's coming off like five final fours in a row. And I just always thought the excitement of games like that uh, was great for our kids, the experience you get from that. And, you know, hopefully we can kind of replicate that here with, uh, with some big time opponents and then hopefully getting those big time opponents in the, in the Robbins arena at some point as well. Uh, Chris, speaking of big time opponents, uh, are you comfortable with the way this thing eventually played out? Obviously Detroit and Moorhead were supposed to be home games uh, before COVID hit and now playing them on a neutral court leading up to the Kentucky game on, on Sunday afternoon on ESPN. Well, I am because that was the way we kept 
the tournament together. And so, you know, when they basic, generally we played 13 non-conference games usually, and we're down to nine. And it was important for us to keep the Kentucky game because it's what's called an MTE or a multiple team event. Uh, you know, Kentucky had to still want to do the tournament. Or, and so hosting the tournament seemed like the best idea from, from, for everybody. And so, um, you know, of course, we wish it was a home opener uh, in front of a sellout crowd. But, but yeah, I think this is, this is uh, uh, the best way that we could have kept the tournament together. And so whatever made that happen was, was good for us. All right, just a quick note on the video streaming of that, and I'm going to let these guys go because we're, we're past 720 or so, and that's kind of our, our cutoff spot. But the game, the first two games, the Detroit and Moorhead games, will be on our Richmond Spiders YouTube page online. Uh, as Chris said, they were both supposed to be home games when they became neutral court games. Nobody really thought about how to do video streaming or television of the non-Kentucky games. So we worked out a deal with Rupp Arena and their uh, multi-camera video board feed. I think they have six cameras. So you will get a six camera view with replay and our Spider Sports Network radio call mixed in with it for the first two games of the season. It's free of charge. It's on our Richmond Spiders YouTube page. We will have the link out everywhere when we get to next week. And then the Kentucky game is on ESPN on Sunday at one o'clock. More information, all of that is on our website, as well as interactive ways to follow the spiders. And don't forget about the hashtag one Richmond and our spider athletic fund campaign that continues until Tuesday, December 1st with our giving Tuesday day. Chris, Aaron, thank you so much for tonight. Uh, let's get out there. Let's throw that ball up in the air. Let's tip it off. No matter how fans are following the spiders, we're really excited for a great season for both of you. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you very much. Guys. All right, and again, thank everybody for watching and interacting with us and your questions. Jason Vita from our PR department. Megan Dooley, thank you so much for facilitating this Spider Basketball Preview. I'm Bob Black. At some point, we hope to see you in the Robin Center. If not, we'll see you on radio, we'll see you on TV, and we'll see you on Spider social media. Stay healthy, everyone. Uh, stay in tune with us with Richmond Athletics.